Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me today is Owen Papworth, co-founder of Oregonics Farm. Thank you very much for joining me today, Owen. Hey, thanks for having me. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. Oh, and people familiar with the podcast know that I like to start with a little bit of background. So how was it that you found yourself in the cannabis industry? Oh, man, uh, that's kind of a fun story. Uh, <clears throat> my brother was one of the earlier uh, medical cultivators in Oregon. He was actually a you know legacy cultivator before the medical programs were even uh, issued and was one of the first medical growers. Uh, and so he's quite a bit older than me. And, uh, you know, I got the opportunity to, you know, help him and assist in his cannabis cultivation, like from a pretty young age. Uh, and so that's kind of how I got introduced to it. And uh, I don't know, kind of the rest is history, but a lot of, uh, you know, big, small plant counts and big uh, outdoor, like large individual plants uh, in, you know, sun grown down in Southern Oregon. How young is, I started a little young. <laughs> Uh, well, I actually, you know, got fell in love with cannabis at about 11 years old <laughs> and okay. uh, kind of a unique opportunity. Uh, and, uh, I would say that I started helping him on cultivations when I was like in my teenage years, like 13. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of, that's kind of where it started. What was it like watching your brother transition from the legacy market to the medical market? Uh, I would say that it was, you know, a lot of fear uh, around regulation. Um, and it was pretty intense. Like I would say, actually, I remember at the end of when I when I was an outdoor cultivator with him, uh, we kind of had a little bit of a falling out for a couple of years there, uh, on the tail end of some pretty stressful times. Uh, and I would just say that the transition told me that I, I made a decision I was only going to grow indoors. Uh, and uh, if I was ever going to again, and um, you know, it's pretty crazy where you've got overlapping laws, like basically you've got state laws that say one thing, federal laws that say something else. And, uh, you know, if you're serious about staying, uh, you know, felony free, uh, you know, it's, it can be a pretty in intense time. Why did you decide to only cultivate indoors? Uh, I think just because, you know, when you got helicopters flying around your crops, uh, you know, in law enforcement, like doing, you know, can see your plants and comes and does checks and, you know, kind of harasses you about it. Uh, that was kind of the contributing factor for me. You know, you got your, you're out in the sun, you can go on Google earth and see our plants. Uh, yeah. so yeah. I mean, that does sound incredibly stressful. How do you decide then like, no, you know what? That's what I want to do. Uh, well, I haven't ever really been very risk averse, um, you know, and, uh, I've always looked up to my brother in a pretty major way. Uh, you know, he's an intense guy. He's a pretty accomplished competitive athlete and wrestler and football player. And, uh, you know, his, uh, he kind of laid the foundation for me, uh, kind of not so much of a stoner, more of like a militant, uh, kind of a disciplined person that really like instilled in me that if, every detail matters and we are in control like i and and what i get out of it is going to be what i put into it um and uh, that just kind of laid the groundwork for me uh getting involved in the recreational market later so getting involved in recreational how did you come to organics uh so i i met a good friend of mine uh matt schwimmer whose uh, father is my business partner david schwimmer uh, who is the CEO and uh, another co-founder of Organics Farms. Uh, the two of them had a dispensary uh, in, or a couple of dispensaries in Oregon, uh, and uh, they now have sold those. Uh, and I think that the that relationship, uh, you know, led to this opportunity with uh, in Illinois. Okay. How are things going in Illinois? Uh, well, I mean, it's great. I mean, I would say that the uh, the market is has a lot of maturing to do, um, <clears throat> but also has a, a number of challenges. I mean, I'd say that regulatory wise, the biggest contrast between Oregon and, and Illinois has to do with uh, the regular regulations. I mean, I, I routinely have uh, a state police officer at our facility doing a, a tour or a state uh, regulator from the Department of Agriculture uh, on site, like weekly or every other week, uh, depending on what's going on, they'll just show up. 
uh, very different than our facility. You know, I have another company in Oregon uh, and I've had a series of them here. And so I, in terms of Oregon and recreational, uh, you know, I'll see a, a regulator uh, if there was a complaint or uh, maybe once a year, if that. Uh, so it's a very different uh, situation. The, the regulation is about 100 times more in Illinois. Um, which is a, a much higher bar to entry and, uh, you know, higher cost and and a challenge to operate. Is that, do you equate that to growing pains in Illinois just because it's a younger market or do you think they're going to be more militant kind of for the foreseeable future? I think they're going to be more militant for the foreseeable future. I mean, I, I think that uh, regulated markets over time are the healthiest for the people that are for the businesses that are involved in them. Typically, as long as they don't allow too many people to get involved in the Illinois market, uh, <clears throat> the people that are uh, in business there will at least be able to make a living. And I think that's the challenge that we faced in Oregon is that they didn't restrict any of those. I mean, now they've restricted after they issued thousands of licenses, then they came back and, uh, put moratoriums in on licenses. So it's going to take much longer for us to recover from oversaturation here in Oregon. Sorry, I'm actually at my house in Oregon uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, Illinois, I think, has uh, a smaller number of, of businesses, but they're more sophisticated players, uh, meaning that they're capitalized in, in a more heavy way. Uh, and, uh, you know, and because they're more capitalized, they're able to draw on more talent. Uh, so you end up having a more challenging competition. A lot more of them are vertical. Significant number of people have five to ten dispensary chain, uh, stores instead of it just being like one or two. Mm -hmm. What's the company that you own in Oregon? Uh, it's called Sitka Northwest. Uh, we make a, a brand called Disco Dabs. Uh, so it's a, a, a variety of extracts, uh, vape carts, uh, infused pre-rolls, uh, and other products. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, was there anything in particular that you've had success with in Oregon that you wanted to bring to the Illinois market, or did you kind of want to start fresh? Oh, uh, I mean, it's definitely not a start fresh. Uh, <laughs> so it, it is very much the latter. I mean, I would say that my philosophy is to copy the best and then and then emulate the best and then uh, innovate from there. And so, uh, you know, I'm continue, continuing to innovate all the time, but I'm also copying things that I've had success with. Like uh, the, you know, the most critical example of that with organics actually has to do with the design of our facility and our cultivation leadership. Uh, so those two things are things that have been practiced by myself and my team uh, for mm, over a couple decades in terms of combined uh, knowledge. So I brought in the absolute best cultivator that I have ever met. Uh, his name is Andrew Wise, a uh, very talented guy, um, you know, very plant health focused and, uh, you know, is an innovator in this space. And so I would say that through the, through my experience and his together, uh, we've designed the facility to maximize efficiency uh, per per foot of production and also for quality. Uh, and so there's a ton of, of information uh, that we have copied from other facilities and, and improved on. You know, if you get to make the decisions again, you try to make them better, you know. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that seems to be what works for those who can be successful in the market. What is your philosophy when it comes to facility design and the equipment that you bring in house? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> philosophy around facility design. I mean, so like one of the things that's that we built into the facility uh, for cleanliness is that we compartmentalized everything. And so what that means is there's a multiple there's multiple entry points and exit points to every cultivation room, and they. Uh, attached to hallways that are isolated from each other that you can compartmentalize staff. So like, say you had uh, an issue that you wanted to keep contained within one room and you wanted to, you know, you had, you had one room, you had identified a pest or a mold or something. We haven't really had to do this much uh, because we're so militant, but I, uh, the design is inherently built into the facility where you have these compartments uh, that allow us to, you know, have what we call a clean side and a dirty side to the cultivation uh, you know, it's, it's all really clean. Um, but that's like one of the things that, you know, we, we bring to the table, uh, design wise. Is there any equipment that you couldn't live without in Illinois? Um, hmm. well, I mean, I would say as a craft grow, since we have limited canopy feet and we're competing against people that have multi hundred thousand foot canopies, 
uh, that efficiency per foot is 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 paramount, uh, and 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 also that also is mainly related to yield and quality per foot, uh, because we have to we have to have extremely high quality product uh, in order to be competitive since we have less and we have to produce a lot per foot. Um, so I would say that our mechanical system would be you know lighting and mechanical, but probably just mechanical because the environment that the plant lives in, um, you know if you think about it on like a uh on a gradient like between on one hand you have outdoor cultivation and on the other hand you have like precision climate control where it's like one percent one degree of variation you can control anytime you want you want to change the temperature humidity up or down uh you're able to do that i would say that obviously outdoor is extremely inexpensive uh you know and then on the other side you have extremely expensive uh infrastructure so we're as close to the precision side as we could possibly get with our budget and uh you know, during COVID with supply chain issues. <clears throat> okay. What type of cultivation do you do? Do you use aeroponics? Um, what do you guys, uh, what's your method? Uh, you know, we, we use, a, technically it's hydroponic, but we use a soilless media, which is cocoa um, fiber. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a hydroponic, uh, you know, mineral, like mineral based uh, fertilizer uh, that is, you know, injected using a automated system. Okay. So you recently launched uh, Northern Heights. How how has the launch gone and uh, what has been the response? Well, uh, it's been, uh, you know, overwhelmingly positive. I, I would say it's, you know, <clears throat> man, uh, both from our customers, people in the community, on social media, even on uh, the Illinois Trees uh, Reddit page, which is pretty popular, you know, seeing people post uh, comments uh, about, that it's the best cannabis in Illinois. Um, I've seen that posted over and over and over again. And it's just, I'm incredibly grateful that, you know, to, to have those kinds of reviews. Um, you know, I would just say that we're, we're really excited to release the strains that we have uh, coming because what we originally started with was clone only genetics that we brought in from a trusted supplier. And actually on the 20, seventh of this month we're going to make our first harvest of our own pheno hunted proprietary genetics uh the first one's animal styles and so those are exclusive to organics completely those genetics are not grown anywhere else um those phenos and uh you know that's kind of where uh the unique fingerprint of organics is going to really hit the illinois market i mean it's it's cool to have people like the stuff that we grew from other people's cuts but uh, i'm very excited to for the feedback of the genetics that we grew. Was the decision to use other people's cuts, just the reality of starting up the business versus the time that it takes to pheno hunt? Yeah. I mean, it was a substantial uh, amount of money. Uh, I, originally I was going to hunt the the seeds and then kind of at the last minute, Andrew and I were looking at it. And, uh, and, and again, it's like we, integrity is a really big deal to everybody at organics. I mean, that starts with David, uh schwimmer at the top and it kind of goes down from there like if we're doing it we want to do it right we want to do do the very best uh and with that in mind i would say that uh <clears throat> we weren't going to release genetic we weren't going to release genetics that we weren't happy with but when andrew found uh, a reputable supplier a good friend of his that he was able to get clones from because i was like hey if we could figure this out you know we basically save about a million dollars um or an 800 or some crazy amount of money uh, instead of waiting like six months of production or eight months of production in order to pheno hunt our own genetics. And then you kind of come into pro to market with a bunch of chaotic genetics. Cause it's like, if I do pheno hunts, I've got all these different, uh, plants instead of having like, you know, when we have super Boof hit the market, like that came from a clone, they're all the same. It's all consistent. And I didn't really want to put something on the market that we weren't really proud of, I guess, and had any variability at all. Uh, and so that's kind of the primary decision making behind that. Well, that makes sense. It's so much easier to come out and gain consumer trust and maintain it rather than lose it and then try to get it back. Yeah. And that's something I have a lot of, uh, you're talking about things we brought from Oregon. Uh, I would say that that's a, a big thing, you know, having watched brands, uh, you know, get really big and then go away really fast. Uh, you know, I know that it's not so much about how much market share you can grab, it's what you can keep. And it really comes down to serving the end customer. Uh, I think that's one of the things that people miss uh, most often is that what do we do this for? 
you know, it's, it's for the end consumer who, you know, is, is, you know, selecting a product from a menu and is excited about it and goes home and, you know, opens it and, and goes through their whole experience with that. I mean, we're changing people's lives, uh, you know, in that moment. And I think it's, uh, that, that's something that we take pride with, you know, and that's like why we do what we do. Is this need to do it right? Why you chose to do craft cultivation? Uh, so I have this unique relationship with practice. Um, having been an entrepreneur for a number of years, I've had, you know, worked in product development. I've had a number of different companies where I designed and manufactured products for uh, for the hydro industry. You know, I've had a rent number of different farms and, and different things. Um, you know, I would just say that uh, that practice uh, it, it became my focus instead of the actual results. Uh, and, and that may sound a little weird, but what I'm getting at is that having failed so many times to achieve my direct goal, uh, I've noticed that uh, if I focus on get just getting better consistently, like, okay, it's not going to be perfect, but do we make some progress today? Are we headed a little closer to our goal? Uh, and making re- re-identifying my uh, perspective on what victory is uh, and uh, making it about small victories and daily ones. Uh, conveniently though, I will say that if you do that a lot, you start to win some big victories. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I hear that from entrepreneurs a lot. It's the, uh, that ability to keep pushing forward. Um, that is when they eventually achieve a level of success. Whereas, I mean, I think that some people have this idea of what it is to be an entrepreneur and they don't realize how many, you know, how many L's you got to take in the process. Oh yeah. I mean, for Um, me, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead for you. Oh, I was just going to say that like, it really all came together when I got introduced to jujitsu about seven years ago. And, uh, you know, I went and and dedicated myself on the mat to, uh, and you basically just go lose a bunch and it kind of like brought all my entrepreneurial losses, like into focus. And I was like, Oh, okay. It's okay. I get better when I lose. It's okay. As long as you can survive those losses and focus on the next step. Uh, And those adjustments that, you know, you get better with uh, that. Yeah. I mean, you make a lot of progress. Do you, as a craft cultivator, do you face any unique challenges that some of the larger companies don't face in Illinois? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I would say that if I was running a facility that like we we have 5,000 feet of canopy. Um, And so if I was running a facility that say had a hundred thousand or 200,000 feet, uh, it would be very easy for me to assess a number of tiers of products uh, where I could put multiple brands out. And for us, we have limited capacity. So like we kind of have been niched into the spot where we need to compete at the the high premium level. Um, and what that means is that, you know, if you have, I think there's like four or five other craft cultivators active right now and there's more coming. Um, but let's just say that there's like 20, 30, 40 of us uh, competing for that top tier, uh, shelf space. Uh, the, the big challenge I I think is you're going to see a number of craft for the craft grows as a whole. You're going to see a big challenge to compete for that market space. Cause you have big guys that are competing for that space that are able to compete better on price point. Um, and then you have an, all the other craft grows that are trying to compete for it as well. Uh, and there's, there's just no guarantee that everybody's going to be a winner. Like that's just not how that's going to go. Uh, it's part of why we do everything that we do to try to, you know, have a precision, a level of precision in what we're doing so that we can make sure that we're in that top like 90 or 95th percentile of cultivators. Is Illinois still in a green rush, you know, sort of that rush that we see out of the gate when a state comes online? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. I mean, the analytics that I've seen say that Illinois has the most expensive uh, cannabis products in the country right now. Uh, and having watched, you know, legalization roll out with, in medical, you know, state by state and also recreational starting in Colorado, moving around from from there, you know, in Oregon, California, uh, you know, I would say that there is a paradigm that is unfolding, um, you know, and in the beginning, the cultivators have the dominant position um, and then it kind of transitions to the retailers as supply increases, the retailers kind of get to command their price and control the market. Um, And then as saturation continues, it's really the processors and the product manufacturers that kind of clean up at the end. Um, And and my my perspective is we're somewhere between the retail 
and processing phase in that in Illinois. But I mean, the rest of the country is all through that whole cycle. I mean, almost all the way. I mean, I, I don't want to speak. Some of these places like Florida are still developing really big time, uh, you know, and I'm not super familiar with many of the other states. Uh, but the general shift is we're definitely in a green rush in Illinois. OK, how do you maintain a positive relationship with the retail side of the business? Just so you know, you stay at the front of their mind. Uh, well, one of the things that's pretty unique uh, about us is that we have another arm of the business that's uh, that we're working on developing, which is uh, another business that's owned by David, which is Emerald Dispensary. And so we have a plan to roll out a, a, a chain of dispensaries. Uh, and what's interesting in Illinois is that there's so many vertical uh, businesses, companies that own uh, cultivation, manufacturing, and uh, retail stores that there's a lot of... Uh, uh, how do I explain it? So it's uh, basically like I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of a deal uh, where like, you know, if, if we stock their, their, our shelves with their product, they'll stock their shelves with ours. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. Um, so I would say that that, you know, is if you're <clears throat> basically that uh, the market in Illinois, you know, has a lot of vertical players. And, you know, I think that we're trying to be one as well because it's going to, you know, give us the best position long-term. Okay. Um, you said there were only a handful. I, I saw that there were, at the time I checked, there were 10, only 10 of the 87 craft growers who were licensed were operational. Why is that the case? Okay, so that's that's a recent number, and 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 uh, you know I, my numbers are a little old. Uh, I would say that it's extraordinarily expensive to start a craft grow and complicated. Um, I would say that you know those are kind of the two uh, two things. The compli, but mainly it's money. Uh, very difficult to raise capital uh, for a cannabis business. Period. Uh, you know, and, and in the volume that is needed for this, uh, one of the issues is that it's not easy to make a budget that's really accurate uh based on the information at the beginning of like for us to start in the beginning you know we'd have to know the complete cost of a build out uh with, without going through plan review with the county uh and not having a complete checklist of requirements from the state like there's stat there's statute and then there's you know what they have posted but there isn't like it the the unknowns uh make it very difficult to make a budget so you basically have to just like you know pick a number and then multiply it by four and then you're probably somewhere close uh so that's kind of the answer okay how did you guys do it i mean how are you so quick like i want to say quick out of the gate but also seeing some pretty quick success um i mean it, I, I it's a top-down deal you know, from the start, our CEO and co-founder, David Schwimmer, uh, is hell-bent on getting this thing operational at the high level as quickly as he can. And so everything that I've done in his direction has been like as quick as I can at the highest level that we can execute it. Um, and I and I would say that, you know, his background in, in finance and insurance, you know, played a, a big uh, role in that because, you know, we were able to, you know, raise or generate the majority of that capital uh, to be able to do it. Um, and I mean, that's just a challenge that with the unknowns, I mean, it's really hard when you get a bill for a few million more dollars than you thought it was going to be. I mean, that's the kind of, you, if you want to be a cultivator in Illinois, like, and, and do it fast, I think that that's the kind of situation that you get, you need to be ready for is like, are you going to be ready to pull out your checkbook and write a, like a few million extra dollars for the budget, you know, because that's the kind of deal it is. When you move fast, sometimes there are missteps. Sometimes there are unforeseen challenges. Any come to mind uh, in terms of, let's say, a teachable moment for uh, people that might be looking to do it after you guys? I mean, the biggest thing I can tell you is just budget. You know, yeah. it's like and, and this is the hardest part because you'll you'll make a budget and then you add 50 percent to it. You know, like they say in business school, they're like, oh, you know, double or 100 percent, you know, double, double it up. Um, I, I would say that I would factor that by three or four. Uh, if you want, or at least have lines of credit or the ability to, to draw on that money and have a plan for it. Even if every logical thing is telling you that you're not going to need that money, that would be my biggest takeaway actually is that, you know, cause you make a plan you're like, okay, what if I add this much more for contingency and, oh, and it's even higher than you think that it should be. And everybody on the team says, oh yeah, that's way more than it should be. 
Yeah, you should probably double it again. <laughs> so what was the biggest surprise for you in Illinois so far? Ooh, biggest surprise. Uh, I mean, it's probably between the county and the state uh, with unknown things like, you know, the interpretation of statute and also the wielding of new codes in the county that we picked uh, where they had never used it on anybody. Like things like I have to test my runoff water for THC in my cultivation, which is about the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life, considering oil is not soluble in water. Um but, it, you know, it just has to do with the disconnect. We're kind of the first in that in that area or one of the first. And, and everybody's just trying to make sure that uh, they don't both at the state level and the county level. You know, everybody's got it. They're trying to cover their ass. They're trying to make sure that, um, you know, they don't hurt the environment or other people. And so everybody's really scared and careful about cannabis since it's new. I understand that fear. But are they also like excited and trying? Is it more of a partnership? Because, I mean, just seeing some of the figures in terms of the revenue generated by the Illinois market, I have to imagine that the regulators want the market to succeed as well. They do. And actually I, I would, I, I mean, I would just be the first one to compliment the people at the IDFBR uh, and the department of ag, like for being helpful. Uh, you know, these are people that we're on a first name basis with that I can shoot a text message or an email to that are like really quick to, you know, get back and help us. Uh, and they're through very challenging situations. It'll be like, Okay, so do you need to, like oh hey you're gonna start in a few weeks and uh, you need access control on every door that you didn't have it on and and here's the kicker is that like in that specific example it was all approved previ previously by their department but it doesn't matter because if you have a problem you have to be able to operate within their regulations so um, you know they've been very workable and helpful they've helped me expedite uh, changes to the facility that we needed you know adding our rosin production on is, is a big deal and they're really helpful with that um, so it's a challenging job on both sides you know I would say it's not so easy to be a regulator everybody's upset with you all the time too like that's a fun thing you get to tell people you know like that they need to spend tons of money or disrupt their whole business uh and uh yeah people aren't very happy with them i think the reason why they're nice to us though is that we're always nice to them <laughs> no it's i mean uh it it's it's like the a tale as old as time right like if you just conduct yourself in a professional manner uh manner you know it's gonna come back to you we hope so and yeah it has so far i mean yeah i really it's it's we've definitely developed a, a strong working relationship uh, with uh, uh, the Department of Ag. Yeah, and I I apologize for that tale as old as time thing. I apparently, I saw Disney on ice this weekend and it just apparently really affected me. Oh my God. It came out of nowhere. Um, so uh, I read that you guys like to bring a Midwest touch to your uh, cultivation. What is, in your opinion, what is that Midwest touch? Um, okay. So I'm going to try to say this without uh you know being inappropriate but so basically like i my my i'm from oregon uh and so my and uh don't, and a ton of discipline and high level people have come out of oregon both in the cultivation space uh and uh other industries okay i would say that the entry level and the 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 labor force uh that we have access to in oregon when i contrast it to the midwest i would say that the midwest has a uh, a, a much more sophisticated and disciplined uh, workforce. Uh, so I've actually been able to assemble the, what I say is the strongest team that I've ever led. And uh, I think that that is a testament to uh, the differences that are between, uh, you know, where people are from. And I think it makes a big difference. You know, culturally, uh, Chicago and Illinois are very different than Oregon. Uh, I feel like we're able to find, uh, I mean, there's a number of people on our cultivation team who have degrees in cannabis cultivation which is just a total, uh, you know, I, I was totally blindsided by that. It, it's amazing uh, to have people that went to university who chose to go to school uh, in Illinois and uh, got degrees where they actually uh, cut clones or did tissue culturing and then, you know, uh, grew and harvested hemp plants where they, you know, uh, went through all of the steps and processes that we use in our cultivation. I mean, roughly uh, in school. Uh, and so that, that that's very cool. I, I would say that the people are the primary difference. You know, when I talk about Midwest touch, it's like, okay, it's really about execution. Um, and I, yeah, I'm very proud of our team. No, the uh, Midwest, I definitely know 
takes a lot of pride in that Midwest work ethic. So, I mean, it is, it's interesting that you say so many of your um, cultivators had that education uh, as a foundation for other, um, for other employees that maybe didn't come from that sort of pedigree. Do you look for experience in any particular type of industry or, you know, when you get a resume for somebody that's looking to break into cannabis, are there some things that stand out in terms of like, okay, you did this previously. It might translate to somebody that's a better worker on our floor. Uh, yeah. I mean, I actually, uh, try to make my cannabis professionals not hire them if that makes sense if at all possible uh, i found there's a potential for issues with people who have substance abuse frankly uh you know that are kind of melded into the cannabis industry and so i find that like the things that i'm hiring for first are typically uh things about who they are as a person um, so it's like, do they have a healthy relationship with their ego? Do they have goals that align with the business? Um, are they you know, able to look at themselves? I mean, that's kind of the ego thing. Cause from there, if you, if you take somebody who's, you know, stable enough and disciplined enough, uh, that has any, any background, uh, you know, they waited tables or they're a construction worker or, a you know, an, an insurance salesman or, or whatever, right. We can teach them about cannabis, uh, but you can't really teach people how to be stronger humans easily if they don't have enough of the prerequisites. So I really am just looking for the prerequisites. Uh, and then I love it when people have, uh, you know, skills that apply to the operation. Like a really good example is like somebody who's an officer in the military, right? Like who then now for, for a number of years, and then now is like our director of operations. It's like, as we work through these battles of adjusting and, and growing our business, it's very clear where leadership in the past, like is now translating into the future. And, the ability to do hard things and to persevere and adjust, you know, those are things that we really value. So is it, so are you saying that like workers that were previously in the legacy market in Illinois might be more susceptible to like substance abuse problems or people that just are interested in the market in general? So like, it, it's not, uh, it's not that they would be disqualified because they were a legacy cultivator. Okay. It, it, it doesn't, I mean, obviously that's what I was. Okay. So it's not, it, it's not so, uh, I'm not, I'm definitely not prejudiced against people who have been in this for a long time. It's just that it's on its own. It's not like, Oh, I get a stack of 20 resumes and four or five of them are, you know, have legacy experience. Uh, so all of a sudden those are at the top of the pile. Like that's just simply not how it, it works. It, it's more about who they are as a person, what their values are, you know, ability to do hard things, discipline. Uh, and then are the e ego is in check and they're able to, you know, le learn and integrate new inf information and be part of a team. Uh, and then if they happen to have those skills, uh, then it's just a bonus because then they kind of know the territory. It's like, okay, we're not growing in a tent in your garage, but we're still using nutrients. We care about the climate. We care about bugs. We care about cleanliness, you know, stuff like that. Okay. What is your approach when it comes to bringing, uh, new equipment in house or starting a new process? How do you vet those manufacturers or suppliers? And, you know, because it's a big capital expense. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I teach it. All right. I, I treat it kind of like a thread that you pull and you just don't stop pulling. And so that means that it's about bringing in every possible knowledge resource that we can prior to making a decision. Um, so if we're talking about a new process that and sometimes it's something that hasn't been done at all, you know, uh, and I have to do research like in other industries, you know, especially we're talking about process manufacturing. And that's kind of more of like my organ business thing. But we do have an extracts, uh, you know, uh, facility that's being built uh, next year in Illinois. So that will be, you know, rolling out. Um, but I would say that there's a hefty R&D process and fact check process before we make decisions. OK, I guess one of the common horror stories we hear with people, especially in new markets, is the uh, the story of the like dusty equipment in the corner that doesn't work. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, I've seen it a lot. <laughs> um, I, as far as and I've replaced a lot of equipment at other facilities. Uh, you know, we don't currently have anything that's like that. Okay. Um, but I've seen a lot of extraction equipment, like as they developed, uh, you know, CO2 extractors, like those things are basically paperweights and there's like, you know, probably a few billion dollars of them sitting in storage. Um, yeah. You know, and that's a good example because as the knowledge chain changes about how to do, uh, how to do things better, you know, people are replacing their equipment. 
So you mentioned that you have a couple of strains that you might be rolling out. Uh, what can people expect, you know, going forward in Illinois? What are your plans for both the foreseeable future and maybe a little bit further out? Uh, so near term here, we have some new strains that are launching. Um, you know, we have animal styles, uh, Gogurts, uh, Unicorn Sherbert. Uh, you know, there's a couple others that are all going to drop in April. Uh, you know, we just launched our six packs of joints uh, and uh, have some blunts that are coming. So some one gram blunts that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, we also are getting ready to launch uh, live rosin. I would say that that will be on in May, you know, most likely. Uh, pretty excited about that. For guys that are into premium products, uh, there's not not doesn't really get much better uh, on the extract side uh, than live rosin. So for flower guys at the high end, you know, we have our eighths of premium flower, and then for you know people who like to dab, there's nothing better than live rosin. And I'm just thrilled uh, to see the quality we're able to put out uh, you know, from the facility. Do you have a personal favorite in your product portfolio? Uh, I mean, for me, I would say the strawberry dairy, you know, it has the most, to me, it has one of the more unique uh, profiles. That's what's available now. Uh, what's coming though, the thing that I'm most excited about that's like in the facility uh, right now is the unicorn sherbet. Um, and that's a plant that Andrew, uh, Fino hunted in a previous facility and was able to bring it in, uh, and uh, it's just amazing. Can you provide any insight into the naming conventions for new strains? <laughs> like sure. Uh, so there, naming conventions. Uh, there is a rhyme to the. There, there's a you know to the chaos. There's a rhyme to the reason. Um, basically, what they do is they take categories of names. So it's almost like uh you know cookies okay like if you have like girl scout cookies and you start crossing it with something else they might not take girl scout cookies or cookies and, and move it over uh they might take another word that they associate it with like it could be cake or champagne and they have these names and you look online there's a whole like whole bunch of information about how they name uh products but you basically have to come up with an as, as a, a breeder comes up with a name that, that is associated with the original parent name and then they use that to create the new name okay okay that actually makes way more sense than i expected <laughs> <laughs> yeah it seems like it's all just made up especially as a processor like i see literally thousands of names come in and we have to mix them and make formulate batches based on uh you know what the extractors are trying to make uh and so the names can get pretty crazy what are your most popular products thus far in Illinois? Uh, I would say that the the products that are the would be the Super Boof and the Bomb Sauce. They're both very high potency, uh, and the Super Boof is just crazy. I mean, it's I think our first batch has tested thirty seven percent total cannabinoids, um, so it's not you know hard to yeah to see that we would get the kind of reviews that we've been getting. I mean, is that on you? Do you have somebody else that helps you with that? Like uh, sort of watching reviews and comments online or do you like to do that personally to kind of keep a pulse uh i mean i think that the cultivate the cultivation team uh kind of has that as a sense of pride um because you know as a cultivator you know you're you're paid for your hours or for your your time and uh the production is what it is and it's not really until this having worked in cultivation a lot you know the sales uh, are really where you're getting your gratification. And so when you hear people who are out using, you know, if you make a product every day, if you're a maker and you have reviews about your product, I mean, it's about the closest thing you're going to get to human connection related to your, you know, your, your trade and your craft. And so I think that there's a ton of ownership, you know, I can't even tell you how many text message threads, we have a text message thread in the business and, and how many times these reviews get posted. I mean, there's gotta be, you know, 50, 60 screenshots that I've seen of like, I found this one or I found that one. It's like, here, look what they said. Like, you know, and, and, uh, and those are also good opportunities to adjust too, because you'll hear a customer, you know, uh, talking about like the price points, for example, that's kind of the one thing that we've, you know, received uh, critical feedback and we've actually responded by adjusting our prices, our pricing, uh, you know, to meet then consumers, you know, demand. How would you describe the current state of the cannabis industry in Illinois? Hmm. Um, I would say that it's, it's growing and changing that there's a lot of change that's happening. Um, and I think that the people, you know, you have new craft growers that are coming online, 
Uh, you have more dispensaries that are coming online. So that that's a pretty significant thing that I think is probably overlooked is uh, I believe there's 175 dispensaries that are online now, roughly. Okay. And I believe that there's another hundred and a quarter or God, I, you know, I wish David was here. He would know. Uh, but there's a, a significant number of dispensaries uh, that are on that are coming online. And so when that number goes from 175 to say closer to 300, you're going to see a substantial increase in the total unit volume uh, and sales that are happening in Illinois. I mean, safe, easy access to customers is a huge deal. Uh, and so I'm really excited to see and and that kind of everything else is kind of following that. So you have craft grows coming online. Uh, you have cultivation centers that are, you know, working to expand their businesses, uh, you know, to grow more feed, to add uh, brands. You have other white labeling companies, you know, coming in and doing deals, uh, bringing their brands to Illinois. Uh, so I would say that it's on a pretty steep incline right now in growth. Okay. Do you have any other states on your radar that you're interested in potentially uh, dipping into? I don't know if I should uh, say this. Well, for me, I mean, personally, uh, Texas is like kind of the last frontier. And so in the event that Texas changes its laws, uh, I'm, it, that's a drop everything I'm doing kind of a do that situation. I think it's like the third, second or third biggest economy in the world. And you know, when that happens, it's going to be a, a serious green rush. Well, Owen, I really do appreciate you taking the time today. Um, before we get out of here, is there anything else that, uh, you want to make sure the cannabis equipment news audience either knows about yourself or organics? Uh, no, I mean, I would just say, you know, feel free to, to reach out, uh, on LinkedIn. If you guys have anything that you're interested, interested in or have questions about, I mean, my name's Owen, uh, Papworth and I, that's my name on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to reach out, shoot me a message. Uh, you know, if there's anything that we can collaborate on, or if you have questions about our products, I mean, I'm, I'm always looking to make our business better. And, and the way we do that is, you know, by uh, connecting with other people. So yeah, I would just say thank you so much for having me on. And uh, yeah, we'll see you here again soon. One thing I'm curious about before we get out of here. So you like started in cannabis at a very young age and you've seen nothing but success. Well, seemingly ongoing success, ongoing success. Um, do you have, as an entrepreneur, do you have interests outside of cannabis or do you think, you know, you're kind of here to stay? Um. I kind of go where the where the challenge is, is the thing that I uh, I have interest in real estate and product development and other you know and, and applying these skills to other businesses. Sure, uh, and I'm in, I'm continually pushed back into cannabis uh, because it's the thing that I I know the most about, uh, and I think that actually what's probably going to happen is that I'm probably going to be even more involved in uh in cannabis uh especially in the processing and product manufacturing side uh because there's a tremendous amount of innovation that's coming that people don't really see around standardization of products like right now everybody's making unique products but the technology does exist to repetitively make the same premium products uh, with like exact same formulations uh much very you know in a very similar way to you see like how the cigarette industry like makes like every pack the exact same way well with cannabis like we can replicate that uh and i i think that there's a tremendous amount I, i'm pretty sure i can live the rest of my life and continue to do what i'm doing and still have new challenges <laughs> well thank you very much again owen and uh you know i hope we get a chance to do it again soon all right cool well just let us know hey thanks appreciate it all right, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. All right, for Owen Papworth, co-founder of Oregonics Farm, I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. We'll see you next week.